Okay, so um, we got through uh, a look at uh, Kolmogorov factorization, and then before that, um, the uh, bilinear transform. Um, Kolmogorov factorization is exact, at least under the conditions that we set for it, like not desiring any, um, any particular frequency to go to zero after filtering, you know, zero energy. So, um, you know, under those uh, fairly tight conditions, uh, Kolmogorov factorization is not even uh, um, not even uh, approximate. Um, and it's time to um, illustrate this with a, a real filter. And so, I hope you've um, uh, encountered the Butterworth filter in the past. Um, when you do bandpass filtering in SAC, for instance, that's the one that's that's uh, there. Um, <clears throat> and I have not uh, implemented it in um, um, in my uh, GRG package because I, I uh, implemented the more general z-plane uh, facility. So you can. Uh, what we're going to end up with is a filter that you can um, that you can uh, put into. Uh, you can put its poles and zeros into z-plane um, and uh, do filtering that way. And uh, the reason uh, we're looking at Butterworth filters is, is mainly, though, so you can understand the Butterworth filter that is used in SAC and everywhere else. And again, um, you know, we're starting with the very simple work on every seismogram separately. So you know, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about considering seismograms all together in terms of a seismic record and having data sets that are two-dimensional in time and space. Right now we're dealing with data sets that are one-dimensional. The uh, independent axis is time. And uh, uh, earthquake or, or reflection seismograms are kind of our prototype data set with all their attendant properties. So. Um, Let's uh, actually take both of these uh, um, tools that we, we talked about last time, the bilinear transform and Kolmogorov factorization, and let's find a, um, a causal bandpass filter that has rapid time decay, so we can apply it very easily, very cheaply in the time domain with convolution. Um, and that'll make an effective bandpass filter. So the, just to develop the filter, first we'll talk about um, this low-pass filter. This is not really a band-pass filter, but a, a low-pass filter. So the desired objective of our filtering uh, will be to um, retain frequencies near zero and then pass at, at, at frequencies farther from zero, you know, either more negative or more positive than some omega zero, which is going to be a a um, adjustable parameter, okay. At those frequencies, um, we want zero response, and we want to keep everything that is uh, in the lower uh, lower band, the lower frequency band. So here's a uh, uh, here's an equation. Uh, you know, we to to use um, the bilinear transform, we've got to start with a closed form expression for the frequency response that we want. Okay, And here is one. Um, so our uh, spectrum, our filter, our, the characteristic spectrum of our filter, and since it's a Butterworth filter, we'll call this capital S sub B, uh, with respect to omega. And this is going to be uh, B conjugate omega times B of omega. Okay, um, You know, where B is the Fourier transform of the Capital B is a Fourier transform of the uh, Butterworth filter time series, little b. All right, that that um, that characteristic is going to look like this. Uh, it's one over one plus omega over omega uh, zero, uh, with that ratio taken to the power of two n. So you know we have a, a an order of the filter little n, which kind of uh, is going to determine how severe the filter is going to act. Okay. 
And uh, the higher the order n, the more closely this equation uh, resembles a, a box. Okay. So for n equals one, you know, which which results in omega over omega zero squared here, we have kind of this uh, um, this uh, uh, upside down parabola, I suppose it is. Okay. And and notice that you know it doesn't do a very good job of filtering at omega zero. Okay. Um, but uh, as we um, uh, as we increase n, then it will become more and more boxy. Okay, so very simple, uh, very simple expression. Now, now we could we could take this and, and digitize it, right? We could decide. All right, I'll I'll take uh, some sampling of uh, along the omega axis, and and uh, I'll have this s sub b of omega at discrete values of omega, and uh, I could. Then plug that directly into uh, Kolmogorov factorization, and the resulting filter, you know, little b of t, is going to be causal, but it would also be infinitely long. Okay, and then there's always going to be having to deal with the question, okay, what, you know, how long is long enough, you know, and that's that's going to be another approximation that affects the, um, you know, how well the filter works and what frequency it works at and all that. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's use all the tools at our disposal and first apply the bilinear transform. Okay, so we have um, uh, omega hat uh, minus i times omega hat times delta t over two is equal to one minus z one plus z. So it's basically substituting um, uh, you know we're substituting for omega in this uh, equation here <clears throat> and. Um, so uh, omega squared now, which is what we're going to need to plug in here, right? Omega squared, if you multiply it out, is uh, four times one minus one over z divided by one plus one over z, uh, also times uh, one minus z divided by one plus z. Okay, so uh, a little complex, but uh, you know you can do the do the algebra and 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 uh, plug and chug it through. Um, so we have, uh, you know, and I should have written b conjugate of one over z uh, times b of z is uh, uh, is uh, what this uh, spectrum is defined as, and uh, so now we have it in terms of z. So it's uh, 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 another interesting feature uh, I think you might have noticed is that um, the delta t has dropped out here. All right, so that's that's helpful, you know, just in terms of keeping track of things. All right, so um, we've got uh, uh, one plus z. Uh, I'm sorry, one plus one over z uh, times one plus z. Okay, so that's a z polynomial. We take that product to the to the order nth power, and then on the bottom we have a sum of two polynomials, and the first one is one plus one over z times one plus z. Uh, to the nth power again, and then the thing we add to it is four over omega zero. Right there's our there's our adjustable parameter. Uh, I'm sorry, four over omega zero squared times one minus one over z times uh, one minus z, and then that whole thing, um, you know, including the the parameter omega zero squared, that whole thing to the nth order power. Um, so what we've got here, you know, I mean, this is a, a Nasty lot of algebra, and rather than write it all out, uh, sometimes I'll just express it uh, in in this way. We got, um, you know, we could factor this into parts of the numerator that are in one over z, right? You know, here's a part of the numerator that is in one over z, and it's already pretty well factored here. Uh, here's a part of the denominator. That's in one over z, right? So there's part of the denominator that's in one over z. There's another part of the numerator, right? That is in in z, okay, uh, and another part of the denominator that is in uh, uh, in z, okay, and and there they are. Um, <clears throat> now, okay, so the 
the really the 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 Kolmogorov factorization comes here in that we are going to drop the things that depend on one over z, right? Because the things that depend on one over z are non-causal, right? They're putting things in the filter that are at negative time. Okay, so so what we want is a b of z, right? That we have we have b of one over z times b of z, and that's got all these factors in the numerator and the denominator. And what we want is just to retain the causal part. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, that's uh, <coughs> that's uh, b. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> that's uh, just b of z. Uh, the Butterworth filter of z is going to be uh, uh, the causal part of the numerator divided by. <coughs> excuse me. The causal part of the denominator. <coughs> uh, okay. So um, you know that's that's all the Kolmogorov factorization is, um, you know, just recognizing the uh, the various parts. <clears throat> so now let's express um, this uh, uh, b of omega in the Fourier domain, okay? And um, uh, now so we're going to be using the Fourier definition of z. Right, uh, z is equal to e of the i omega t. I think is, uh, and then there's also delta t's and delta omegas in there. But we're assuming those are one uh, right here. So um, <coughs> we're going to multiply uh, everything by, uh, and, and this is you know this is one of these algebraic tricks that uh, I, I suppose after playing with it uh, for a year, you know somebody uh, uh, Butterworth came up with this, right? Um, or maybe it was clear about. I don't know. Um, so uh, you multiply the numerator and the denominator by this square root of z times one over square root of z, right? So we're just multiplying the whole thing by one, but we're kind of, you know, we're kind of going to factor out the square root of z here. Um, and um, <clears throat> okay, uh, and let me assure you, we can take the square root of z, uh, especially in its in its Fourier uh, form. And um, so here's the whole thing, okay? Um, you know, with the uh, with the uh, uh, the non-causal part and the causal part, you know. So there's a non-causal part, you know. There's a non-causal part, and there's causal parts, you know, that are in Z. All right. Um, so uh, uh, now. Um, uh, if we write out the Fourier definition of z, you know, and of course you could take its square root by by taking you know half of the uh, exponent, right? Because an exponential is the Fourier definition of z. So to take its square root, you just take half of it, and and then so this would be like e to the i omega t over two, and this would be e to the minus i omega t over two, and you, then you write out those exponentials and. And and this just breaks down to uh, two cosine omega over two. All right, so there's the omega over two. Um, you know that's where that came out. But uh, uh, you know everything else, so this uh, square root of z plus one over square root of z just uh, reduces to this very simple cosine. Okay, so we have the spectrum b conjugate of omega times b of omega is now equal to and, and so you know substituting everything in right because look at how how nicely this uh, this goes and then you can see where you have 1 over square root of z minus square root of z okay analogously uh, and, and again you can do the algebra if you're interested uh, you know that'll give you uh, sine um, omega over 2 um, so uh, um, you know things are, uh, are are simplifying pretty nicely here so in the numerator of this uh, spectrum, we have two cosine omega over two to the power of two n, and then here's two cosine omega over two to the power of two n, and then plus uh, also in the, in the denominator four over omega zero, our adjustable parameter times sine omega over two, and then the whole thing there, that whole term to the power of two n. So that that is the uh, you know for any Butterworth filter. This little formula here will give you the um, the frequency, uh, 
you know, at, at any at any omega, this will give you the characteristic uh, frequency spectrum of that uh, of of any Butterworth filter. Uh, well, Butterworth low pass filter. Okay, with your adjustable parameter omega zero and with your adjustable order n, little n. Okay. So um, all right, um, now we need to find the time domain filter, okay? And um, so we've got this mixture of z's and one over z's, right? We've got the the uh, uh, in the z domain, you know, we've got the uh, the non the anti causal part, and we got the causal part, okay? Um, so for the numerator. Um, we're just going to use the coefficients of one plus z to the nth power. Okay, so that's in you know what's in the numerator of our filter, right? We got a rational filter here. We got to divide it out at some point, but um, uh, we we've uh, um, you know we want to ignore the uh, negative time coefficients. Okay, so we're just going to ignore that, and we're going to take this one here that's in. That's causal. It's in positive time, <clears throat> and so all we've got left is in the numerator is one plus z to the nth power. Okay, so the numerator is easy. Okay, and and how many coefficients are there going to be? Um, you know, if we have order one, there's going to be two coefficients in the numerator. So it's a really easy convolution, right? No sweat to that convolution. Uh, for the denominator. Um, we uh, we got to apply Kolmogorov factorization to this uh, uh, denominator in the omega domain. Okay, so uh, it's not quite so easy to you know because they're all mixed up there. It's not quite so easy to um, to cancel out the non-causal parts. Um, so um, you know then we express this in our in our sampled omega. Right here's our frequency formula for the denominator. We express it our sampled omega, and we get then the Kolmogorov factorization gives us polynomial coefficients in the z domain, and then since it's in the denominator, we can use our recursion algorithm. And how many are we going to end up going to end up with? Well, um, we're going to end up with uh, um, you know a limited number of coefficients. It depends on on the uh, <coughs> uh, on the order again. Okay, and so you know if we if we try to take the order too high, you know we're going to get an unstable filter. Okay, it gets too close to zero and so forth. You know causality here um, uh, implies that uh, you know through the uh, uh, through the Hilbert transform, causality implies that log of the uh, the log of the of the characteristic spectrum exists everywhere, uh, but of course, a perfect bandpass filter for you know say uh, n equal to a thousand um, is going to have um, is going to have uh, um, uh, you know uh, spectra equal to zero for some uh, uh, omega is greater than uh, omega zero. You know, at higher frequencies. Okay. So um, uh, now, uh, some of the um, some of the details of the Butterworth filter are left for you to to uh, work out in uh, in lab three. So we can, uh, you know, with that 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 lab is really there uh, for you to make sure you understand the Butterworth filter, uh, at least partly. Um, Okay, I want to uh, go real quickly through this uh, delay um, section here um, that'll finish off notes number nine. <clears throat> and um, uh, so, you know, I think we all understand what a time delay is. Okay, so if you observe a, uh, a seismogram right over the uh, right over the, an earthquake, uh, it's going to come in pretty fast. The waves are going to come in pretty fast. If you go, uh, you know, 100 kilometers away from the earthquake, there's going to be some delay before the waves come in. Although that maybe they'll be kind of similar to the waves that you saw near the earthquake. And um, uh, this delay, you know, is just another example of a, of the application of a filter. So uh, 
this, this physical model that I described in the first couple days of the class is really a, a pervasive concept here. We, you know, any physical process like wave propagation, uh, any change in the waveform, um, any processes like uh, uh, attenuation, reflection, um, you know, even earthquake sources and source processes, you know, we we could describe as a as a filter. Um, and and some of the you know some of the aspects of those processes we can describe as a filter in one dimension, just on on the seismograms on the time series, okay. And this delay is a is a perfect example. You know, we we are interested in finding the filter such that we have the input x, you know, which is the near source seismogram, and we filter by some filter f, and we get an output y, which is the far field seismogram. Okay, so uh, you know filters can do delays. They can do physical processes. Um, um, I'm not even saying here that the the filter has to be physically based. Um, there's uh, uh, a lot of um, a lot of work based on um, oh, and I forget what they're called. You know, one one way of expressing it is as uh, is as match filtering. Okay, where you uh, you very simply you know, compare the near near field and the far field seismogram, or you compare any two seismograms, and you just statistically, you know, without without understanding the physical processes processes at all, you just come up with a filter that that uh, uh, will uh, you know transform one to the other. Okay, and that's a valid thing to do. I mean, uh, it may be a little unsatisfying because you're you're just you know. Using data to to uh, um, to learn how to transform one to the other without understanding the physical processes, but sometimes you know that data is really telling us something you know like that one of our understandings of the physical processes is totally wrong, um, and uh, that's uh, an example I can give you for that is is when um, you know people started looking at uh, regional seismograms and. And uh, you know they built up the the uh, transformation and the delaying filters, you know, out of their understanding of the physical processes of wave propagation in the crust, but they didn't have the ability to to account for the say three dimensional trapping of waves in sedimentary basins, and and so the people who were doing the non physical you know wave matching and match filtering were able to to predict. Waves in the basins far better than the people who were actually, you know, doing the physical processes, and, and we had to wait, you know, 20, 30 years until we started to be able to actually, um, you know, model the the physics of the 3D wave propagation in basins. So, uh, and that's that's something I've been working on too. So it's by no means invalid to. Uh, you know, drive your your filtering observationally. Uh, you know, based on data. Now, when people don't have they don't have data and they have no understanding of the physical processes, then I start worrying. Then I think, well, it's kind of an academic exercise. Okay, but if you have either one, you can make some you can make some valid points and valid discoveries. <clears throat> of course, you know we want to have both, but we don't always have both. Okay. Uh, so that was time delay. There's also this concept of phase delay. Okay, uh, and, and consider that you have um, um, that you have a sinusoid that, that's going on ad infinitum. Okay, um, you know it doesn't it, the the energy isn't compressed into little uh, um, you know these are these are little uh, um, you know minimum energy delay. Um, uh, minimum phase wavelets here, okay. So the energy is limited and packetized. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if we clip out a piece of a seismogram, you know, from from within a, a whole long um, uh, seismogram, you know, we just see uh, ongoing reverberation, okay, ongoing sinusoids, and we can still express a delay between those without, you know, you know, the energy flow here is constant. With time, 
but you can still express the delay uh, between two seismograms. And that's called the phase delay. So that's the, you know, here we have the zero crossing up is at zero time, and here the zero crossing up is at this later time t sub p for the phase delay. Okay? So, uh, uh, you know, phase delay comes from tracking, uh, comparing points on the, on the two waves that have the same phase. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the actual phase number would be zero at that, at that zero crossing up. Uh, if we're if you're talking about a uh, a sine wave, okay. Um, so uh, okay, so here's a sine wave. X of t is equal to sine omega t, and uh, then y of t with the phase delay is sine omega, the sine of the quantity omega t minus phi, and that little phi is uh, the phase shift. Okay, uh, it's not the phase the phase shift, right? It's in radians, right? The phase delay t sub p is in time, um, and so here's how to express it in time. Right? These are both the same sinusoid down here. Um, so sine of omega times t minus t sub p, the time delayed by the phase delay, is equal to the sine of the quantity omega t minus phi, which is the the phase minus the phase shift. Okay. So we got a time delayed sinusoid equal to the phase shifted sinusoid, just you know written out in different ways. <clears throat> so uh, uh, we've got omega t minus omega t p is equal to omega t minus phi. Okay, and and right away, all right, we can relate the phase delay and the phase shift phi through the frequency omega. Okay, so that's uh, you know. Very simple. Now, of course, the phase shift is a little bit uncertain, right? We could replace phi by phi plus two pi times any integer n, right? And we would get the, exactly the same result. Okay, so there is that. You know, the phase delay can be arbitrarily large, or it could be arbitrarily negative, right? N could be a negative number as well. So. Um, now, there is that uncertainty. OK. Uh, again, you're probably saying, yeah, but you know, in all the seismograms I've looked at, you know, none of them are sinusoids that go on forever. Or if they, do, if they are sinusoids that go on forever, that means that's a, that's a geophone that wasn't plugged in, and, and so I'm going to throw that trace away anyway. <laughs> or it's a seismic station that, that is not working, and we're not going to use it. All right, so let's talk about group delay. You know, we, we got this packetized energy here. Uh, and this is just to you know, kind of remind you of of some of the simple mathematics that goes into this. You know, we're 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 more interested in a delay that tracks energy rather than phase, right? Because our physical processes are throwing energy around and delaying the arrival of energy. And that's you know, first if we're going to calculate a the the rock property of velocity, we got to track that energy. Okay. Um, so uh, you know, there's some. Physically, you know, if we can get that energy delay, that uh, it's going to be called group delay, that's going to tell us something about the velocity along a physically significant propagation path. Um, and, and and of course, you know, as you might have suspected in all this discussion of instantaneous phase, you know, energy does not often follow the instantaneous phase. Um, you know, it's not the energy is not at the at the zero time arrival of the minimum phase, okay, it's somewhere else. It's later. The energy is coming in a little bit later. Okay, so um, uh, you know, here's a simple exercise that that you know maybe you did in high school, and it's just I'm just reminding you here of the impact on on what what we're doing. Okay, so we're going to sum up two sinusoids, okay, that have different frequencies. So x of t are are Data here, our input, is cosine of omega one times t plus cosine of omega two times t, and then uh, you know maybe in high school you put in the trig identity, and so you got that you have the product of two cosines here instead of the sum of two cosines. All right, so x of t is equal equivalently to two cosine of this quantity 
omega 1 minus omega 2 over 2 divided by uh, times t. Okay, and then the other the other thing in the product is the cosine of omega one plus omega two divided by two times t. Now what are we looking at here? I mean, clearly, all right, omega one and omega two are different. This this cosine is is dealing with the average frequency of those two. So we have two different frequencies. The second cosine, you know, is is going off the average frequency. Okay. And this is this this cosine here is half of the difference between the two, and and let's say uh, you know let's let's say that you've got um, frequencies that are relatively close together, you know that means the average is going to be, um, or or the difference between the two and especially half of it is going to be much small a much smaller frequency, okay than the average frequency, okay. So you're going to get uh, this, um, you know, kind of carrier, this high carrier frequency, which I've drawn here as the higher frequency, that's modulated, okay, or scaled by, right, the this beat frequency, which is the low frequency, the small frequency, okay, and there's the beat frequency sinusoid, <clears throat> and it's scaling the. Um, um, it's scaling the you know what I might call the, the higher carrier frequency. Okay, so the energy is kind of packaged, right? So so you know if you look if you do the the envelope or the instantaneous energy, you know here where the beat is crossing zero, you're going to have uh, a small envelope, small energy. You know here where the beat is is large. Uh, you know where the sinusoid is near, uh, uh, or the cosine is is at zero or minus one, um, um, or I mean at uh, zero or pi radians. Okay, you're going to have the energy you know concentrated here in the middle of the beat. Okay, so the uh, energy is packaged by the beat sinusoid, and that in a way the the beat looks a lot like the envelope. It, you know you could think of the beat as being proportional to the to the end, to the instantaneous energy, um, probably what the beat squared would be proportional to the instantaneous energy, something like that. Okay, so um, uh, all right, so we have some filter, and we're going to add a phase shift and delay both omega one and omega two. So omega one in this in this cosine. Uh, and then that's going to give us this output y, right? After filtering, and the effect of it is going to be this uh, phase shift, which is going to result in a phase delay. So we have um, we have omega one uh, t uh, minus uh, the first phase delay phi one, or the first phase shift phi one, and then uh, uh, and then we have omega two plus. Um, and and I wrote in here minus, so it really is minus phi two, okay, um, and uh, so just cross out the plus there. Is that a t or a plus? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, of course it's a t. Yeah, right. Omega two times t minus phi two. Uh, so we have a second uh, phase shift, and of course that means a second phase delay. Uh, so the output now is. Uh, <laughs> You know the beat is affected. The beat cosine is affected by um, uh, the difference between uh, uh, omega one and omega two, and then there's the difference between the phase shifts, right over two here. So the beat is is now has a phase shift, which is the difference uh, of the phase shifts, and the the carrier, which is you know operating on the average frequency, is going to be phase shifted by the by the average phase shift. Okay. Uh, now let's express it. Uh, you know, just to nail this down, let's express the beat sinusoid in terms of a time delay, a phase delay in time, t sub g. Okay. Um, and so uh, you know we have um, uh, the beat is omega one minus omega two over two times. Um, T minus T sub G, okay, and the uh, <coughs> and this is just the beat now, and this is uh, 
equal to uh, uh, this cosine here, right? This is the way it's written up above. And so then we can make the equivalence between, um, on the left, omega 1 minus omega 2 times t sub g. And then on the right, uh, the, phase, the difference between two phase shifts, phi 1 minus phi 2. And so you know, what is the phase delay in seconds? It's going to be uh, uh, phi 1 minus phi 2 divided by omega 1 minus omega 2. And another way of looking at that is it's the change in, in, uh, in phase divided by the change in frequency. Okay. Well, that kind of makes sense. Um, you know, and you can see dimensionally it all works out. So if we have a, a spectrum, right? So, so you know, thinking about all right, we're, we've applied a filter that's resulting in this phase delay and phase shift, um, you know, and, and just thinking about the beat, okay, because that's how that's what's packetizing the energy, right? Um, we're not we're not worried about the carrier. Um, so we have some filter, you know, maybe it's the Earth even wave propagation of the Earth that's resulting in these phase shifts. And, uh, and so our, our Earth filter is going to have a, uh, it's going to have an amplitude effect, okay, an amplitude spectrum, but it's also going to have a phase spectrum. Okay. So, and that phase spectrum is going to be capital Phi of uh, Omega. I don't know if I really drew a capital Phi there, but that's what it's supposed to be. So uh, capital Phi of Omega, that's the phase spectrum of the filter that's causing these shifts. Okay. And um, so you know, here we have uh, uh, you know maybe we could even express that that phase spectrum as a continuous function you know over omega. So uh, if we take the right, we had uh, delta phi or delta uh, omega. Thinking about you know continuous omega, what we really have is the derivative of phase with respect to omega. So the group delay. Uh, at uh, at any frequency is the slope of the phase spectrum relative to frequency. Okay, so when we see slopes in the phase spectrum, you know that's resulting in a group delay. And that's really you know that that's an important that's probably for us the most important part of that of that phase spectrum. Okay, and and. and all right. If you have a um, if you have a uh, um, a non-minimum phase filter, right? Then uh, then it's going to be just accumulating, right? The 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 d the d phi d omega is just going to be positive all the way along, and so every frequency you're going to be accumulating more and more group delay. Okay. If you have a minimum phase filter. Right, the the phase might do things, but it's going to go both up and down as you increase frequency, and so you know the uh, the time delay will be more stable. All right, now let's uh, let's look at the group delay of an all pass filter, okay, um, you know which we'll call p of omega, and, and I'll remind you all pass filters are not minimum phase, okay. Usually we use all pass filters to do the delays, so they can't be minimum phase. Filters, <clears throat> okay, and we know that, uh, but they do they do pass uh, amplitude. All, an all pass filter, you know, doesn't do anything to the amplitude at at at, at each frequency. It just redistributes time and phase around. Um, okay, so uh, phi of omega, the phase spectrum, is equal to the imaginary part of of p of omega divided by the real part of the you know, p of omega is the Fourier transform of the filter time series. Okay, so it's got an imaginary part and a real part, and the phase spectrum is just the inverse tangent of the imaginary over real at each frequency omega. Um, and uh, boy, why did I why did I write phi differently there? I don't know. Uh, I'll assume for a second it's not any different. It's the same phi of omega. So um, uh, we have uh, equivalently, right? In our, in our look at instantaneous uh, uh, frequency, we saw that if we take the log of the uh, of the complex uh, Fourier transform p of omega, okay, and we take the imaginary part, that's also the phase. All right. So um, 
uh, t sub uh, uh, g, the, the group delay, is d phi d omega. Okay, so we just have to differentiate this expression by omega. Uh, so uh, the different the derivative operator goes inside the imaginary part operator. So we have the derivative of the log of p uh, with respect to omega, um, which is uh, 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 you know the the okay. So the time delay relative to frequency uh, is t sub g, and that's the imaginary part of uh, the derivative of p with respect to omega, right? And then derive, you know, ha differentiating the log part, uh, we get one over p omega. Okay, and um, um, and then if uh, if p is uh, is causal, if it's a causal um, if it's a causal filter, then the delay is always going to be greater than zero. Okay, at every frequency. All right. Um, now, this uh, uh, this is in the frequency domain on the in the box here. The um, uh, the group delay <coughs> is in the frequency domain, and um, uh, so if we were to transform it back to the uh, um, uh, back to the time domain, what would we get? Okay. We would have uh, the imaginary part of, and that should be d p um, uh, of t divide uh, d p of t over d t. Okay, so that would be the time derivative of the um, of the filter time series. Okay, times one over the filter time series at at a particular time, one over p at t. Take the imaginary part of it, okay, and this you might remember is the instantaneous frequency. That was essentially the the, the definition of the uh, of the instantaneous frequency that we had. So, um, uh, uh, you know, we see that the uh, uh, the group, you know, t sub g, the group delay for every omega, that's like a delay spectrum, and that has a the Fourier transform of that is the instantaneous frequency time series. Okay, so maybe that'll be useful at some point. 